Okay, let's begin. We have a quorum. We have people here. Let's 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 go ahead and let's open a word of prayer. Okay. If everyone can just mute their mics. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight, and we praise you for who you are. We thank you that you are the great God, the one who saves us from our sin. Father, we ask forgiveness for our sin. We we fail every day. We grumble. We complain. We don't have a heart of faith. Our our mind is always wandering, Father. Father, I ask that you would uh, forgive us, and we have confidence because of the blood of Jesus. We ask that your spirit would fill us, and give us the strength to, to, to obey you and do all that you've called us to do, Father. Father, we also pray now for tonight. We just ask that the internet would stay strong. We could have a great class of learning and discussion. I pray that the internet connection will be stable. All those that are participating, they would not lose internet, Father. I pray that you would bless the rest of the semester. I ask that you would strengthen and guide us now give us insight to understand your word and father god as we contemplate the content of revelation that you uh, gave us in the exodus of israel father may we recognize that you are lord you are the, the ruler you are king of the universe you are completely free to do what you want we uh, you are not dependent upon us uh, we are dependent upon you, Father. I pray that we would see this. I pray that we would also recognize that you are the faithful God, that you've made promises to us, and that you will follow through on those promises. And Father God, we submit to your will. May your will be done. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. We are on to the 11th session. The 11th session. And so, oh, before that, we just want to give again uh, just a, a, a recognition to our partners, uh, Eastern Versailles School of Theology, Cebu Graduate School of Theology and Converge. They are making this happen. We could not be doing this without them. So uh, we, we want to give credit to where credit is due. Okay, so we are on to session 11, the content of special revelation during the Mosaic era part one. So from the re for the rest of the semester, I'm not going to review. I'm not going to remove, review any of the, the content from the previous week. I, I would just re refer you to the previous videos. We had the videos upload on YouTube. Watch the videos for your review. We're just going new content, new content, new content, because we just don't have time to review each, each of, the, each of the, the, the last weeks. So I just refer you to the YouTube channel to watch those videos to get caught up. Uh, tonight's uh, overview of tonight's session. So first, we will review the midterm. So I do want to go over for two, two, two full purpose. I want to go over the, the midterm so that you could see my expectations, where you can ask questions, and that you have a clear understanding of what I was expecting, and then maybe it makes sense with your grades. I, I, I feel that I was more than fair with all of you on your on, on grading. But perhaps you would disagree with that. So if you feel that, that I, I graded you unfairly, let's have a, a conversation. Uh, just one-on-one, -on -one we can set up a time. But, but I do want to talk over the questions and answer, the, the answers that I, that, that, I, that I was looking for. But so far, um, I feel it's very fair. And the other thing I want to say is that if you got a poor grade, I have really uh, weighted the... The, the, I've weighted the assignments and the attendance so that you could not do well on the midterm or final and you can still pass the course because I don't want the midterm or final to be a killer for you, okay? So if you're doing the other assignments and you attend all the classes fully, you, you can still pass. So even if you did not so well on the, on the midterm, do not worry because it's weighted in such a way that um, you can still pass the class. So that's not to say you shouldn't try even harder for the, for the final, but I do want to say that. The other thing I want to say is that the questions on the midterm, some of them will be on the final, okay? So the benefit is that you should ask questions, you should pay attention here, you should take notes, because I'm going to be looking for the same thing. Uh, the, the, the final is comprehensive. It's really evaluating the content. And so we'll, we'll be going... We'll be going uh, over that shortly. Then we'll, we'll do a breakout room just to get us back into the, the thinking of, of chapter number seven. And then after the breakout room, we will have a notes and scripture analysis. So we'll be working through the content. And um, 
yeah, so that's that's where really where we're going tonight. I don't want to rush and I don't want to be lacking. Okay, so let's go ahead and ask. We, at this point, we want to. I want to hear your observations. What are your observations? Your uh, your pros, your cons, your questions. Let's go with group number one first. So Kea, or yeah. Okay, so uh, we agreed that uh, on the that the Israelites need to be redeemed from their bondage of slavery in connection to us, uh, that we need to be redeemed from the bondage of sin. And uh, the, the quote that was given, uh, that was given by Tito Buboy is in page 127, the Egyptians were but instruments in carrying out the designs of God. And the other uh, truth or the other, uh, what call this? The other idea that we also agree that it is that the birth is always initiated by God. And our question is, what is page the difference between... Page 128. Sorry. 128. Yes, yes. Uh, the deliverance. Uh, the deliverance. deliverance. Yes, the, deliverance that, yeah, the demonstration of God's grace. So it is in page 128. Again, the deliverance from Egypt was a signal demonstration of the sovereign grace of God. And... In page 137, uh, regarding the Berith, it is always in it. Yes, Berith, it is always initiated by God. So, our, uh, our, yes, what, 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 page 135. Yeah, so what, for, for anything after, after theocracy and Decalogue, let's save that for Wednesday night because. We're oh, okay. actually not going to get, we, we might start it. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, so that's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah, okay, okay. 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 Question, okay. Nakia, yung question. The question, question yes. Our question is what is the difference between propitiation and expiation? Great question, man. That's good. Good. Second, meron pa. Oh, hindi pa pala kasama yung dikalog, ano? Hindi pa pala. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so, so question from me. So what generated, I typoed this, hold on, let me fix this. What generated this question? Whose question was this and what generated Tito that? Tito Buboy. Uh, I see, okay. you know, see oh, no, no, no. I, Danny, Tito Danny, 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 Danny. Yeah, Tito Danny's question, yes. What, what, why did you have the question, Danny? Because according to boss, Sometimes it is uh, interchanged, you know, but it, th th those are two meanings actually. Yeah. But uh, I'm a Mama. bit confused. No. Great question. You are reading. This is such a good question. Just to put this in context, this gets to the heart of the gospel and, and, and a, a bad interpretation, a bad conclusion, theological conclusion today. This is so fundamental. And it's so critical to the gospel. So we will discuss this cigarado. We will discuss thank this. Thank you. Thank you. We will discuss this cigarado. Okay. So when we get there, we will discuss it. Okay. All right. So uh, let's do group number three. Group number three. What do you have, Ray? You're on deck. Give me something okay. good. Uh, er, uh, one one good question raised by Mark uh, because he was confused about uh, the lesson we had previously about. The, the name ascribed to the angels and what yeah. Mark, you can 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 you can you expound further on that? At least Tim could we hear from your question. Ah uh, yes, the the difference between the angel, mine angel, and an angel. So Pastor Tim mentioned yeah. uh, last time that the angel uh, he could not label the angel as uh jesus christ so uh it uh, the angel is similar to uh god jehovah so my question is <clears throat> right I, give us the question because i think we lost mark yeah i think mark want, wants to really get the the your <laughs> your final say about this <laughs> uh dilemma if the, the angel is really Christ, as most of 
us think so? Or from your end, what do you think? Yeah, so, Is it really so, Christ? Yeah, yeah. Is it so, safe to say it's Christ? Yeah, so that's so we discussed that before, so I won't go into a lot of detail this time. But 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 many in Christianity say it is a Christophany. It's Christ in the Old Testament. So that's a, re a respectable, that's within Orthodox. That's a view I've held many times before for a long time. So that's, mm -hmm. if you determine it's, if you believe that God, that if you look at the scripture, you study the scripture and you say it's Christ, that's fine. Okay. The, the difficulty, Ray and, and Mark, I'm sure Mark will listen to this later, is that Nowhere does it call it, it doesn't call yeah, it Christ. So okay, so yep, yep. okay, Mark. So I'm just answering the question now. So I said that if you if you chose, if you chose to identify this as a Christophany, that that is that is a good interpretation. Many in Christianity have taken that interpretation. I used to take that interpretation. So there's nothing wrong with, with saying it's Christ. The the the, the difficulty comes only in this way. Number one, there's no explicit reference to it being Christ. Okay? Mm. So that's number one. So it does not <clears throat> say it's Christ. It just says, my angel or the angel of the Lord. So, so th that would be one issue. A second issue would be that when you look at Hebrews chapter one, you have God speaking in various ways. Okay? Uh, various means to the prophets. It's through angels, through visions, all these different things. In these last days, he's spoken to us through a son. And then, and then the angels are contrasted with Christ. Diba. So, so that's just one example where it does seem that all angels are set in contrast to Christ. Okay, now, of course, people would say, well, the angel of the Lord is not an angel, but Fair enough, but it does say angel. And so what Voss was saying was that the angel of the Lord must be more than just an angel because he, it is, uh, it, he is the divine presence is there, okay? But, but not so much as to be Christ because Christ is contrasted with all angels in the Old Testament. Are you, are you tracking there with the, dif with the difficulty? So what Voss says is, is that, the angel of the Lord is some special revelation of God to man, so that we we actually they actually experience God's presence, but 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 not in the ultimate literal fullest literal sense. Okay, mm. so it's more than an angel, but it's not yet Christ. Okay, yeah. and so that's Voss's position, and so it's like, well, that's a little confusing. Well, yeah, yes, <laughs> I mean, it's it's a being. All angels are created beings, so. This was a created being that manifested God's presence more than an angel, but not yet Christ. And so in the manifestation mm. of God's presence, there is a, a, there is a connection with Christ, the, the Trinity. Okay, so um, maybe that's a hard question to contemplate. Um, but when we get to the New Testament with the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ in flesh, it, it, ex it far exceeds everything that preceded. It's not a, a bad good. It's a it's a good, better, a, a good greater, okay, or good greatest. All right. Is that making sense, Mark? Are you tracking there with me? Yes, Pastor Tim. Yeah. So it's debated. So what we would say here is this: the other option is that uh, it's it's um, more than just an angel. So that it's it's revealing the presence of God, but not yet Christ. But not yet Christ, <clears throat> because because there's something so unique with the coming of Christ. He is God in the flesh. It's so powerful. So anyway, it's debated, mm -hmm. and and even I was I was looking recently at some other uh, fellow classmates of mine and they were they were saying it was a christophany and so it, you know it, this is debated it's really debated if you chose either one of these it would 
you know, you need to be convinced in your own heart that this is what God takes. But this would be an this would be an example here where we can agree and disagree. You can have different interpretations, and it's totally fine. If you're more comfortable with saying it's Christ, that's completely fine, because many people have have understood it. There is evidence for that in, in, in the fact that it's talking the first person. Um, um, Paul describes the rock as being Christ. So, so there there is there is there is also um, evidence for that, but um yeah so that that that's all i'll say there uh we can talk more about that later it it's heavily debated that's the thing that the, the scripture is not really clear on it but voss is emphasizing is emphasizing and, and voss is really what convinced me that i i take i take this position here i just recently i went with this position here voss convinced me of that so um good all right uh group number four group number four yeah we, we just discussed uh Page 116 to 117, the statement okay. that says uh, free choice is not uh, a divinity out of whose womb righteous gods and righteous men are born together. Uh, it lacks a spiritual uh, pregnancy. So I think uh, what, what I, I, I agree with this statement because uh, this is uh, somehow related to G uh, Genesis 6. When after the fall, men were just uh, were, were depraved, totally corrupted, yeah. and every inclination of man is evil. Yeah. Uh, I think that's uh, basically we our, our discussion rounded up around those uh, those statements. So depravity of man affects choice, right? Right. And, and so I, I that that's one. Going back to our discussion in the midterm, that's really why I wanted to emphasize is that is that man's condition is that th the sin is such that it's affecting our our thinking and our doing. Okay, it's it's not a when you say free choice, man always has a choice, but it's what is the condition if 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 the condition is such that I'm always going to choose evil, you could you could give you could give a man free choice all he wants, but he's, but his, his nature is such that he's going to choose the bad. Okay. So that, 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 that's, that's, that's getting at it. So great, great observation. Anything else you want to add? Chalmer Murray Jesus, either pro or criticism or question. Tim, I'd like to bring also the, uh, to our attention, yung na raised earlier, Dini John Mark. Yung, he, he is astonished by the way God presented the, himself according to different names. But, but yeah. still, sabi, sabi ni Joe Mar, he observes that at, at, at the end of the day, he, he does not want to be known as who he is talaga at the time. Now, Jomar, did I say it right? I mean, it, it somehow uh, gives an idea that God doesn't want to be boxed when it comes to giving his name. Okay, Jomar, can, so, yeah, can, you, yeah. can you elaborate that one, Jomar? Did we lose Jomar's not around. Anyway, the thing, uh, team, the way I understand it in previous uh, classes that I've had, the reason behind that is, diba, in, in Middle Eastern, the name is so important that you cannot just uh, give it away or to yeah. anybody because at some point, if you give that, somehow the other person will have uh, authority over you yeah. is that right yeah um i have to think about that i haven't heard that but that's definitely possible i'd have to think about that yeah yeah it's one of those classes that attended it, give, given that you if the moment that you give your name to another person it's as if you are you become subject to that person that's why god does not want to reveal himself in giving his real name to anybody something like that anyway tim in from my end tim uh in page 119 ba yeah, the, yeah as far as moses is concerned the, the, he was he has these three offices as mentioned right yeah 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 the yeah, prophet yeah. the priest and the uh, king but yeah. at that time there was god was still king but why would he yeah. why would uh Moses be considered taking those three at the third office of kingship. Yeah, so we that's why so every time so uh in talking about types, 
a type is always deficient because it's not the real thing. Okay? okay. So we talked about three weeks ago. I would refer you to watching that. I think earlier in the lecture we talked about. So we talked about uh, Moses being uh, Moses being a prophet, priest. But we said we said here, and even Voss corrects it. Voss does not call him a king. He calls him a leader, uh, like, like a royal leader, because he was more than just a prophet, because he functioned as the leader, just like Joshua. He functioned as the leader leading the people uh, out of bondage and into and, and the promised land. So he's more than just a prophet. He's more than just a priest, but, but he's not king. God is king. And so... But but the, but the leadership role is such that it's because you need the type you need the type to point to Christ. Okay, am I, am I tracking there? So Voss is clear that we don't want to call him a king. We would say that he's a royal leader, and 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 that's the deficiency of 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 a type. Whenever you have a type, it's deficient in in picturing the real thing. Are you tracking there with me, Ray? And and remember, Christ is God, right? <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah. so, so Christ. So really, the, the kingship stays the same. It's God, who's the king, but 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 it's it's the God man. It's the God man. So it's man and God as the king. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm just confused because the way I understand it, we have probably, correct me if I'm wrong, but mostly if you take the position of leadership, mostly it's an executive function, but it's mentioned here. He, 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 it takes the legislative function, so somehow I'm just confused with taking the type or role as a king. But yeah, so, please. Yeah, because if uh, in the in that in that context, at uh, all times, if you are the king, you are both the the executive, the legislative, and the executioner. Na nasa yun lahat ng functions. You are the king, so you execute the laws. You also promulgate the laws. At the same time, you punish. Those who will violate the law. Nobody can punish anybody for violation of the king's law aside from the king. So that's why uh, he is given those uh, unique powers, so to, so to speak. But in the context of Moses, he is being, that's why uh, Tim is using the type word because he is, Moses is being uh, related to. Christ's role later as a priest, as a prophet, and as a leader. But uh, the only difference is Christ is the king. Moses is not a king. That's the difference. Yeah. And so explicitly, Moses is never called the king. He's called the yeah. servant of God. So the servant yeah. enacts, he enacts what the king wants. So in many ways, yes. he's just fu functioning as a steward. And so we see that really in the Hebrews... Hebrews 3, 1 to 6, that's the connection. Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant in all of God's house. Jesus is the son. So, so, so I would say, um, I would say, Kuya, um, Kuya Ray, that it's really, uh, he was leader, but he isn't acting like you say, legislative. He is, but remember, he's not creating the law. So in, in, uh, in John 1, 14, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So in that passage, Moses was only the means by which the law was given. God gave the law. So, so in that sense, Mo Moses was not a legislative person. He, he did not legislate the law. He just was the means by which the law was given, number one. and then. Um, with the judgment and also with the leading, yes, it's true that he was the leader, but again, he's leading on behalf of the king. So he's really functioning as a, as, as a servant. I, I, I really, I think that's important for us. To, 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 to so boss, is, boss is, not, is, is wrong in saying that nonetheless, through his legislative, legislative function, Moses typified the royal office. So it's not the way you're saying, right? So it, 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 it's true that Moses was not really the person who created the law. 
It was he who delivered the law or something like that. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Voss would disagree with that. Well, how did he say it again? Read it to me again. I want to hear it again. Uh, uh, a royal figure, of course, Moses could not be at the time be called yeah. as king for Job alone is king in Israel. Nonetheless, through his legislative function, Moses yeah. typified the royal office of Christ. Yeah, so he is so so he says through his legislative function. So he so he is handling the law. So 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 in one sense, Koyare, I mean, in one sense, he is he's overseeing the legislative law. It's just not it's 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 the difference between means and source. I don't think Voss would say he's the source of the legislative. But he is the means. Maybe I'm splitting hairs there, but I I think that's what Voss is trying to say. Yeah. He is handling the so so. Think about this. Think about this, Ray. The priest had nothing to do with the legislative at all. Nothing, right? The the um the prophets had nothing to do with the priestly function or the legislative, right? They're just they're like attorneys. <laughs> the prophets are like attorneys, okay? So in, in those, so I think what Voss is trying to say is in, in, in if you're comparing Moses to the prophets, to the priests, and to a king, he, he is functioning different than the others. Okay. I think it's in that context. Yeah, it's 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 difficult. I'm not I'm not denying that it's not hard to read Voss. That's why we're doing it together. Okay. I think there is an account actually in um in uh, Deuteronomy. Um, I think in the, in the Jewish antiquity, they think of of king as a kinsman redeemer. Uh, I think in the, in that context of redeem, redeeming people, they would they would ascribe Moses as a king, but not really the king, uh, you know, who you know give the law or, or legislate. But one thing for sure in the book of Deuteronomy chapter seventeen, starting at uh, you know there is in chapter seventeen there is a regulations of of priest and 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 when you look at verse fourteen, there's a regulations for king. Uh, yeah, the king yeah, was yeah. not yet. Uh, Moses, even Moses said, "Oh well, if you are in in the in the promised land, you will have your king that God yeah. will appoint for you." So uh, there is a Moses, even Moses, I would say pro prophesied a king for 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 the Israelites. So at this point, he might be or probably a king in functions as as a redeemer or you know as a. As the Jewish mindset of, of, of in, in the yeah, sense I would of not. Yeah, I would not want to say he's he's doing. He's 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 a king. I would not use. I would use leader. I would use the the language leader. Yeah, I would not use the word king to apply to, because again, that's why Voss is very clear. He calls him a royal leader. Biba. He doesn't say uh -huh. king, but he carries out the kingly function. So so function is not position. So for example. You could have someone, you know, I could I could carry out the judicial function in my house, but I'm not a judge. <laughs> I am like a type of, of, of king, right? So I make the decisions in my house. I, I pronounce judgment on my children. I give grace, right? I, I'm, I'm care I, in many ways, a father is a type of even like a Moses. Like you're, 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 you are also the head of your house. You're you're the one that's praying, that's speaking on behalf of your family. At the same time, you would never, you would never call me a messiah, right? So it's, yeah, that's yeah. maybe that's maybe that's a good illustration to, to really kind of bring it in. So so a father can typify all these different roles, but he himself is not a king or a judge or a priest or a prophet. Okay, maybe that's. I think it is, it is safe to say that uh, he is functioning like you know Adam as a vice regent. Uh, at, in, the, in a sense of, 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 of ruling or you know redeeming people but not not really the 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 the, the regent or the king but he is the vice regent you know i borrowed this term from i think it's meredith klein or yeah KB, or something like that so, yeah, yeah so so you, you can see you can see connection because 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 adam and christ are in relationship and moses and moses is so that that would be an example Sonny, we're, get, we're, we're, we're on the verge here. We're on the verge. But that would be an example where you have a trajectory through redemptive history so that Moses, Moses, there's a, Moses is connected with Abraham and then also connected with Adam, but they're all pointing to, they're all pointing to Christ. So 
So for example, you have, you have Adam, you have um, Abraham, uh, you have Moses, and in some ways, I'll add Noah here, in some ways, they're, they're, they're types, you, they, they, they can look back, but in other ways, they're not. And so Adam is ultimately pointing to Christ because, because so, so what I'm trying to get is, is that that's how prophecy, that's how redemptive history works. There, 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 there are all these connections that find their climax in Christ. And, and these are not, so this is what we're going to get into tonight. So this is the, this is the big debate. We're going to take a break on this point. Okay. Our, the, the, the big issue that we're going to be discussing in this chapter is, are all of these simply types that point to Christ, or is there a concrete relationship between the two? Is everyone tracking there with me? Everyone sees that? So are they just a picture and that's it? Or is there also a concrete connection? Because we're also going to be looking at tonight, we're looking at the redemption of, of Egypt. And so in theology, in theology, this is this is the debate I mentioned with Sonny um, co concerning framework. Is all the salvation of Egypt from Egypt just simply a physical picture of our eternal salvation, or is there something concrete as well? Uh, and so that's what we're going to discuss this, the rest of the night. Okay, we're going to take a ten minute break, but that's the question you have to ask yourself because some people will say. There's no connection between Israel. So, so when we come back, we're going to discuss different frameworks and we're going to get to this issue. There's really three kinds of thinkings along this line. People will say the church and Israel, there's no connection. They're, they're completely separate plans of God. Other people will say the, the church is just a, the, Israel is just a type pointing to, to, to the church, but that's it. It just is a picture. And then another category will say, no, it, it is a picture, but there's also a concrete relationship, but inseparable relationship. So my question as we go on the break is what, what position does Voss take and what position are you considering? So no one mentioned this. I was actually surprised, but we're going to get into this. Maybe this is a whole new world for you to think about. But what is the, that specific relationship? Uh, think about our big picture as well. This is, this is huge when it comes practically on how we teach from the Old Testament and how we view Old Testament. Okay, so with that, I'm going to take, let's take a 10 minute break. We're gonna come back at, so we had a, a, a lively discussion on the break about different views of frameworks. And so um, maybe things aren't really clear. What I wanna do is I'm just gonna outline in general terms. I'm not thinking of specific, of, of a specific theologian when I, when, I, when I describe these terms, because as we talked on the break with, with, with Sonny, uh, different within each framework, you have, you have a range, okay? So um, uh, I, I, I don't want to, to categorize someone because each, each person has their own perspective, okay? But generally speaking, I am going to discuss this because this is important. We, I, I, I promise maybe this is confusing right now, but it'll make sense as we look through. It makes sense why Voss says what he does, because he does talk about some things uh, concerning concrete salvation of Israel. And uh, it is important for us to understand because, as Henry said, it affects us. Okay. All right. So, um. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume everyone's back. Okay, so we're gonna just I'm just gonna highlight really quick. Okay, so really there's there's there was within conservative theology there was for the longest time um, <coughs> there was there was there was two major frameworks. Okay, and this is how they approached scripture. Okay. The first was a covenant, or what they would call covenant theology. 
And the second was uh, dispensationalism. Has everyone heard of these terms? Or maybe you've never heard of these terms? Yes, sir, we heard. Okay, so. We've right, heard so about. Everyone's heard. Anyone, raise your hand if you have not heard, if you have not heard of these terms. I see one hand raised in the. In the Me, sir, Tim. Okay, Kaya, anyone else? Is this the same as historical and dispensational theology, Pastor Tim? Yeah, so this would be this would be dispensationalism that you've like a lot of people have just so this is like the common day dispensationalism if you've if you've grown up in fundamental Baptist circles or fundamental circles uh, they would talk about dispensationalism and, and this contrast with covenant theology. Yeah, I think they are so familiar with, in the context of I think uh, pre millennial, uh, a millennial, and yeah. uh, uh, post millennial pastor. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so. So, so yeah, so this has practical with eschatology. I don't want, we're not talking about eschatology concerning those end times. Pre, just put that out of your mind, okay? We're going to look at more fundamental differences or agreements, okay? And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it does make sense why Voss says what he does in chapter seven with the Mosaic Law. So that, that's the only reason why we're bringing this up, okay? Dispensationalism essentially I'll just briefly, and if you and if and if you have, just to be fair, there's there's a whole range in each of these. Okay, so I'm painting with broad broad brush strokes. If you want to adjust to be fair, I want to be fair. I want to be fair with the positions. Okay, dispensationalism uh, uh, has some very uh, several very fundamental truths. So number one, they would say that there are uh, two plans. Uh, of God. God has a plan for Israel and God has a plan for the church. Okay, so these 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 are two. These are two, okay? And if you interchange or you if you in, if you include the two, then that's already uh wrong. You can't do that. They're always separate, okay? Combining the two is 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 incorrect, okay. And, and the reason for that is, that at the end of the day, they would say in the Old Testament all the promises are literal for Israel, and then in the New Testament it's uh, God put His plan on hold for for Israel, and then He focuses on the church, okay. So that's essentially what dispensationalism says. Does anyone want to add to this? I, I don't want to. You know, we could add a lot of different things, but anything else that's very fundamental that we that we should want to add. Uh, Bobo, go ahead. Yeah, because uh, I, yeah, I've heard, but I'm not sure I, I know the difference between the two. I've heard this pensionization several times, but what I like to know is how is that two related to salvation, if there is any? How about the New Covenant uh, theology, sir? Uh, yeah, so we're going to get there. We're going to get there. <laughs> we're going to get there. Yeah, so it's coming. All yeah, right, so... Uh, yeah, we're going to add because we're looking historically. So historically, the oldest is covenant, and then recently is dispensationalism, and then the most recent is new covenant. That's why we're looking at it like this. Okay, so I want to be fair. Anyone else want to add to what I've said there? Okay, so so yeah, um, yeah. With regards to dispensationalism, actually, it has been revised throughout that time. Like for example, yeah. the classical dispensationalism is a different between yeah. the revised. Yeah. Actually, it has been revised this concept. Now, because of the influence of Fanning and Daryl Bock, uh, it's become now the, what they call the progressive dispensationalism. So um, we now believe in the progression of the covenant, uh, but still hold on to the, this, the, class, the, the classical ideas of dispensationalism that the Israel, the nation, huh? the nation Israel, or the, 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 the ethnic Israel still have hope in the future. And um, I would agree with Bail that uh, that's a their, their interpretation is not really fair with regards to Revelation. Okay, so 
they've been they've been revised many times because they've been caught in error. <laughs> so classic dispensationalism, the first kind of dispensationalism literally said there are two peoples, there are two plans of God. Salvation uh, Israel is saved by works, the church is saved by grace and it's spiritual. Israel is physical and it will forever be on earth. Uh, the church is spiritual and will be forever in heaven. Okay, so that's that's crazy. Okay, so that was the original dispensational view by Darby. The, the, the name here is, the originator of this is Darby. They would say there's earlier views and earlier church history, but historically, to be fair, he's really the one that created this. Okay, so um, what I would say here is that this is, uh, let's just change that. I don't like the green. <laughs> this is, <laughs> that's, that's heresy. Even my father, who's a very strong dispensationalism, would say, would say, no, there's only one plan of salvation for God. So right off the bat, there had to be a major revision because they were claiming two different salvations. Okay. They were claiming two different salvations, uh, Schofield and, 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 and Darby. If so, if you ever have heard of uh, uh, Schofield, the Schofield reference Bible, they, they were, he was a big proponent of this. Okay. Then you had revised dispensations when they said, no, 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 there's one salvation, but there's two, still two different plans. You can't connect the two, okay? Um, and so you had revised, and this is really promoted by um, Ryrie. Ryrie is the promoter of this, uh, big time. And then you had the most recent, this is uh, by Daryl Bach. Daryl Bach. And um, uh, Craig Blasing. And they said, no, 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 no. Uh, um, there is some form of, this is by application. There's partial fulfillment in the church, but it's just by application, not literal fulfillment, just by application. There's still a, a literal future for, for Israel. <laughs> so I hope that you can see here is that <laughs> it's a big range. Okay. All right. Um, let me just, let me last set this aside. Is everyone tracking there? Would anyone want to add? Would anyone want to, uh, is that, is that fair? I, I want to be fair. I don't want to misspeak. I, I come from a dispensational school and also from a dispensational background. So I've had several classes on dispensationalism. My father is a very strong dispensationalist. So I think that this is fair. I, I think this is fair, but would you want to add anything else? Everyone tracking there with me? Then there is no connectivity between Israel and the present time. Yes. So, so that's the, this is the, this is the fundamental, this is the this is the foundation. That's and that's the fundamental issue. And so it seems to be they're trying to they're trying to adjust because it was too strong. So um, and we would we really have to. Uh, this is this is heretical. There, uh, Israel is not saved by works, and I think Voss really emphasizes that. But what I want us to say here is that. You do have a form of work salvation in our circles. Does everyone see that? That, you know, we need to be honest with that. So not just in Catholic theology, but you have functionally a, a works view of salvation in our own, when I say circles, I'm talking just Protestant generally, okay? So this is bearing here, okay? Um, uh, revised is better. Progressive is even better. Um, but we need to look at what the text says, okay? Uh, anyone else want to make a comment before I go on to covenant? Uh, Pastor Tim, yes. uh, this is Yomar. Uh, uh, regarding po sa covenant theology, uh, is it has a two uh, classification of covenant theology like the pedo baptist and uh, the credo baptist Yeah, so, so within covenant theology, you actually have you have, you can have uh, Presbyterians, Baptists, Pentecostals. You can have uh, Credo Baptist, which is baptism on 
the basis of confession. You can have pedo on. Those are all tangential conclusions. Okay, we want right now. What this is is this is these are fundamental uh, doctrinal truths. Okay, so the 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 pedo verse credo. You're correct, but but both can fit within covenant theology. There's actually some Presbyterians that were dispensationalists. <laughs> How crazy is that? So it's crazy. Um, but those are tangential. Those are conclusions. So uh, when we were, were discussing, Henry, you remember this, we discussed like uh, reform theology. We looked at core fundamental versus conclusions. Right now we're looking at core fundamental truths that undergird, that, that, are, that, that from this, the theology is founded upon. Okay. So in covenant of theology, they would say that there is, um, there are uh, three covenants, three major covenants. Okay, this would be the covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. Now, I want to be very clear here. Okay, these are core covenants they hold to many more covenants than these they would say that we view all of our relationship with god through covenant so in the prophets god has a covenant with the night and the day he has a covenant with david he has um, um uh it, it, it's a uh what they would say is they have a perspective of a uh a covenantal framework So God relates to man through covenant. So you see that with Adam, with Noah, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Israel, with, with David, with David's offsprings, and it climaxes in Christ, okay? So, so looking at our view of how much covenant was used at the beginning of the semester, right? You know, just right off the bat, this seems to be a very solid biblical basis, it's all over the place. It's the most of, of all of these, this terminology. Don't worry, Sonny, we're going to get to new covenant. Well, all this terminology, God relates to his creation through covenant. The fact that he has a covenant with the day and the night, <laughs> it's crazy, right? Uh, go back and look at the notes from um, uh, the beginning of the semester, the handout I gave, um, uh, if you have questions on that, okay? Um, but the fundamental covenants are a covenant of redemption works and grace okay and there's so much we could unpack here there's other covenants as well they also see a covenant with noah so this is not all the covenants but it's most fundamental okay the covenant of works is made with adam and the covenant of grace is made with christ and it's administered uh in the mosaic and then in the in the new covenant Okay, so we are we are not under the Mosaic Covenant as a covenantal system, because we're now under the, the these are these are two administrations. Okay, there are two administrations. So so no covenant no covenantal that I've ever read or heard of would say that we're still under the Mosaic Covenant as a system, okay? We're under the New Covenant, okay? But, but looking at this, there's a concrete relationship here. Everyone's tracking there with me. This would be the, the, the big differences between the two, okay? So, so if... So if looking, comparing here, if, if you're going to compare these two, if you're comparing these two, the biggest difference is that there's just one people of God and there's one salvation. So there's one, there's one plan of God, one salvation. That's the difference there. That's fundamentally what it is. I will allow Sonny to jump in here. 
Although, you know, Sonny, you can add with New Covenant. I do think that in some ways you are limited because you're reading one, uh, one uh, group of New Covenant guys. There's a lot of different views on New Covenant. Um, some are premillennial, some are amillennial. So, so uh, uh, you can add, but, we, but, but there is that, that caveat there. Um, so New Covenant came along, New Covenant theology, came along and said that both systems are deficient. This is recently, this is from like the 90s. Uh, New Covenant theology essentially said, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, there's too much continuity between, there's, there's, there's too much continuity in here, uh, too much, too much continuity. That means too much agreement. And here, there is um, the New Testament describes OT as its fulfillment. So they were saying too much continuity. There's too much continuity in covenantal theology. There's too much discontinuity in dispensationalism. We have a new way. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? They said there's there's a too much discontinuity. So they're saying dispensationalism. There's there's too much discontinuity because Christ is our Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, and we're in Christ. So how can we not be how can we not be part of that fulfillment? How can there be a, a different plan of God if we are in Christ, right? So they said there's too much differences in the dispensational system. They they're wrong, but there's too much continuity in the covenantal system. They're wrong. We have we have a, a new solution. What the, what they said was that Israel is a people covenant that pointed to Christ and church, but it's only a type. It's only a picture. So you can see how there's it's th so this one says one so this one says one plan this one says two and this one's trying to find it's not one plan but it's not two <laughs> Is everyone let let me take a pause and ask a question ask a question is everyone tracking with me here if you want to make a comment you can the issues of the New Covenant theology uh, is, is the issue of continuity and discontinuity. So there are, the Old Covenant is discontinued and the New, the new Covenant continues. The New Covenant, which is Christ, right? the New Covenant which is fulfilled in Christ, continues. So the Old Covenant, which is the covenant with Adam and uh, Noah, and Abraham and Israel, David, was was already uh, was designed by uh, was you know designed uh, was designed for for God to to fulfill in in the new yeah. covenant. So so there is some sort of discontinued. There are things there are covenant that is continu discontinued, which is the old covenant yeah. is now discontinued. The Israel, the covenant with Israel is discontinued because the new covenant, which is the church, as prophesied in Jeremiah, and uh, the, the new covenant, which is now uh, involved in, in, in Christ. So I think that's the uh, thing. And yes. one also factors so, so, with the covenant right. is that uh, there is a distinction between the covenant in the Old Testament. For example, the covenant of Adam. Actually, Gary Long, uh, Blake White, and Thomas Reiner has uh, different views on this uh, with regards to the creation. Uh, some would say the covenant of the creation. Or I would say the yeah. Edenic covenant. 
Nasa po si Adamic Covenant, it doesn't matter, it's the same, it's an in-house debate. Uh, there is a discontinuation, when Adam have seen this is a discontinuation of the covenant with Adam, and then the, here, here comes the uh, covenant with Noah, and then and Noah discontinued again, and there is yeah. a renewed, you know, renewed covenant but, with Abraham, yeah. and then... Yeah, but, 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 but Sonny, so, so you're bringing out nuances? And so e those nuances that you're bringing out, dispensationalists will have a different covenant and new covenant. But like, for example, Tom Schreiner, he, he's a traditional covenantal. He has a slightly different view, but he would be within covenant theology. So again, we're not dealing with the comprehensive. We're dealing with the most fundamental. And, yes. so, if, and so if the only difference is that of the Mosaic covenant is ended and we're now in the new covenant, then then there should there there then new covenant theology is really within covenant theology. So because you have those those different nuances within all the different covenants. So you know I, I again there is a slight you know uh, kind of nuances <laughs> as you said. But but what I'm what I'm trying to get at though, Sonny, is that is that the new covenant position is that. Israel is disconnected from Christ. Uh, Israel is disconnected from the church. So there's there's still there's still this this uh, separation there. It's only a type. There's no concrete relationship between the two. So yes, that's uh, why. So that's why. So that's why New Covenant people will say the Old Testament law is abrogated. It's done away yeah, that's with. Really, that's true. Uh, yeah. that's that's correct that's correct and and yeah, so, you know with regards with regards to the israel's covenant um it, it's when you if you are thinking of of the ethnic israel as as abrogated covenant or the old void covenant well uh that that's that's the how the new covenant theology uh comes in that uh, yeah. we would say well the, the 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 covenant with with israel now is no longer applied today in the new covenant because after all, in, in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greeks. Yeah. So uh, it, it doesn't mean uh, it doesn't mean that that you know people or, or individual in Israel or people in, in, in Israel who believe or conf confess their faith in Christ is no longer part of the of the church. What 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 the what he's trying to say is that the, the church now is the new covenant of God. Yeah. 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 A question. Uh, for Sunny or either certain will uh, answer the question. Uh, so, what is the role of Israel in the new covenant now? What is the role of the Israel? You mean the ethnic Israel? Was, yeah, the current Israel right now. The ethnic, ethnic Israel? Israel? No, they, 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 they don't have. What is their role? So, what will <laughs> happen to this? They, they're not part of the salvation anymore? Yeah, if, they, if, if faith in Christ, then they, they, what, if, if a person confesses their faith in Christ, then they will be part of of of, of the new covenant. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because the church now is the new Israel. Christ is the fulfillment of the old covenant. Okay, so, so yeah, so let's just take a pause here. Let's just take a pause here and step back. Uh, what I want to say here is that there's so many different questions we can discuss. There's so many different questions that we can discuss. You know, I'm actually praying about having a class in the fall just on these different frameworks because in many ways this really the practical, so let me get down to the practical. Okay, the practical is that can we directly command from the Old Testament scripture, the law? So for example, can we go to the Decalogue in Exodus chapter 20 and say, thus says the Lord, you shall have no other gods before me. Practically speaking, the covenant theology theologian will say, yes, we go right there. We can directly command. The dispensational, they might be inconsistent. They would say, well, no, no, no. We cannot directly command because that's been done away with. Or, I mean, it's not done away with. Uh, it's, it's part of Israel, and we're not part of Israel. So we can make a, 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 an application, but we cannot command that directly because you are not Israel. We are not Israel. The new covenant theologian would be, would be the same. They would say that it's, done, it's abrogated. We're not under the Mosaic covenant. And so you, you cannot directly command that text. Uh, another example would be the, the, the command for uh, children are to honor their parents in the Lord, okay? 
the covenant theologian would say, yes, we can go to Exodus chapter 20 and directly command it. We can directly command it. Dispensationalists, they would say, no, you need to go to the New Testament to command it. Um, uh, I think maybe the New Covenant would say the same. Um, what's so interesting is that Paul doesn't go to Christ. He doesn't go any, he just directly commands uh, children are to obey their parents in the Lord, for this is the first commandment with a promise. <laughs> so I'm getting down to the very specifics, okay? So fundamentally, New Covenant and dispensationalism, dispensationalists are very hesitant to make direct commands, di direct preaching in the Old Testament. Some do it inconsistently um, with their system, so, so maybe they're more functional like a covenant, but, but, but that would be a practical root uh, difference, practically speaking. I, I'm, I'm trying to give you a reason to consider these things. It, ask a question. Is everyone tracking there with me? Um, ask a question or, or maybe give me some pushback. Uh, so, Tim, with regards to that uh, issues of practicality, we, we are also agree that we are now under the law of Christ, which Apostle Paul, you know, tells that in, 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 the, in, in the book of Romans. And also, in, for example, in uh, uh, the evidence that we are now under the law of Christ, not under the law of Moses, is that, of course, Christ is our Lord. And then we have the you know, evidence in the Sermon on the Mount. And when Apostle Paul says that, obey the Lord, because there is a promise, and uh, I think we, you both and I believe it is a covenant, with, you know, covenant framework, not dispensationalist, that that promise that's been, you know, Lay down in the Old Testament is now fulfilled in Christ. That's why we are now under the law of Christ. Can you preach what? directly? Can you preach directly that command? Yes, can you go to yes, Exodus yes. 20? Yes, you can. We can, so we can go, but hold on, but hold on. So you're going to the Mosaic law to preach it, or are you just using New Testament? You will not go to the Old Testament to preach it. What do you mean by not going to the Old Testament? Well, if we if we look at the if we if we but you're not uh, under the Mosaic Covenant, why would you go to the, the Mosaic Covenant well, to preach it? Well, if I, if I'm going to preach the, the 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 Mosaic Covenant, I would I would look at Christ there. That's that's the that's the one thing but, to see. But directly, directly, Paul gives it directly. First yes, command the promise, directly, but in the context of Christians, not in the context of the Old Covenant. Not, not Okay, I think that, one, that's, that's I think uh, <laughs> my 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 take on that. So whatever so, so, Paul said that yeah. obey your parents in the Lord, which is you know in yeah. the Lord in Christ, yeah. because it has a promise. The promise, of course, as he quoted the Old Testament, the promise in the Old Testament is now fulfilled and keep in in Christ, in in the Christian circle, in the Christian context. So, so, yeah. so, so. so so you're, you're, you're closer to the covenant the theology than the new covenant or the dispensational is what I'm trying to get at. No, I think that that's, uh, I would say, okay. uh, you know. Anyway, anyway, so what, what I want us to do is I want us to think about the, pra pra practically speaking, can we go to the Old Testament and preach? Of course, we always have to consider Christ, okay? But if we're seeing two, if, if, if we're separating Israel, the reason why we can directly preach from the Old Testament is because there's a concrete connection. Of course, we look, we always interpret now, that was what I was emphasizing in hermeneutics. We have a whole section on hermeneutics. I was, I've always been emphasizing, we read the Old Testament uh, considering Christ. So, so that's not what makes New Covenant distinct because We've been emphasizing that from, from the beginning. Um, all of the all of the covenantal theologians from from the past centuries have emphasized reading the Old Testament considering Christ. That's not what makes it unique. What makes it unique, the difference between covenantal, new covenantal, and dispensational, is the concrete connection between the two. Okay. Um, and so let's go to let's go to one passage. Let's go to one passage, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go in, 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 into the um, we'll go into uh, our, our text. Going back to Deuteronomy chapter eighteen, we read this we read this we read this three weeks ago. I'm 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 coming back to emphasize the concrete connection, and then we're going to do a whole lot more examples here. Look at Deuteronomy. Uh, uh, 
1815, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. So the prophet is being raised up like, like Moses. So it's concrete. It's in the context of Israel. Him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord, my God, or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. The Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them and all that I command him. So Jesus is completing what Moses gave, the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to hit, to speak or speaks the name in other gods, that same prophet shall die. If you say in your heart, how may we know that the word, the, the word that the Lord has not spoken, when the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet is spoken presumptuously. You, not, you do not need to be afraid of him. So... <clears throat> The prophet is coming in the context of Israel. The, the Mosaic law was re-ratified many times. It was, it was first given to the first generation. They sinned. They, they died in the wilderness. It was re-given, instituted again to the second generation. They went to the land. They, 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 they fell into to, to sin. And then throughout the course of history, they would re-ratify the Mosaic law. But they kept disobeying it. Then there was the promise of a coming new covenant. So, so the new covenant is new. It's, it's, it's not the Mosaic covenant, but the two are still concretely related. When you read the new covenant terminology, the language, the commands, justice, mercy, um, uh, righteousness, it's, there's a concrete connection between the two. So it's, it's dis, there's discontinuity and it's a new covenant. There's continuity in that there's a concrete foundation. Is everyone tracking there with me? And the big practical takeaway is that when is that we are our foundation, our forefathers are the patriarchs. Our forefathers are the patriarchs. We are sons of Abraham by faith if we have faith in the Messiah. So it's concrete. It's not just the type. So now what we're going to do now is we're going to look in, in, in our PowerPoint at what Voss, this is why Voss is emphasizing the concrete relationship. Let's, let's go to the PowerPoint. Okay, so we're in the history of Revelation here. Uh, we're looking at the mode and content of special revelation in the Old Testament, the, the mode and content of special, special revelation during the Mosaic era. And we looked three weeks ago at the prominence of Moses and also the mode of revelation during the Mosaic era. And so now we're on looking at the content. So we've looked at the prominence of Moses. We've looked at the mode of revelation, the various ways. I will not review that. You can look at the, the video from, from three weeks ago. Uh, so the first thing that Voss brings out, again, this is topical. This is not chronological. This is topical, not chronological. The factual basis and relationship of redemption from Egypt and the New Testament. <laughs> so, so notice how the framework question is right front and center in chapter eight. The factual basis and relationship of redemption from Egypt and the NT. In Voss's mind, there was no new covenant, but there was dispensationalism. So perhaps he was thinking about dispensationalism when he was writing this, but uh, he brings out He's going to discuss this relationship between salvation in Egypt and the New Testament. The exodus from Egypt is the Old Testament redemption. That's a fact, okay? So redemption in the Old Testament is the exodus. This statement is based on the inner, inner coherence of Old Testament and New Testament religion itself. These two, however, different are different forms of expression are yet one in principle. <laughs> so so, so uh, dispensationalists will say, no, they're two, they're two different. They're two different. Covenant will say, uh, 
There's difference, but they're one in principle. Depending on who you read in the New Covenant, the way Sonny describes, maybe he maybe he's covenantal. I, I think maybe he's covenantal. Um, but a, a, a strong New Covenant, at least the ones I've read and, and spoken to, they would say that the only connection in, is in type. The Old Testament Exodus is a physical type to the eternal salvation given, but there's no connection between the two. There's no concrete connection. Voss is saying there is a concrete connection. Listen, the same purpose and method of God run through both. So I'm just, I'm just, these are just uh, statements given by Voss. I'm just highlighting them so that you can see what Voss is saying. Then we'll look at the text. Um, both Old Testament and New Testament have in common is the realism of redemption. So this is real. And again, this is maybe coming off of the, the liberal interpretation as well, who deny the reality. So this is what Voss says concerning factual uh, uh, the, the, the relationship. The substance upon which the impression was made under the Old Testament may have been earthly clay. So this is where the two, this is where Voss is saying. So uh, as you look at future debates, maybe this doesn't have so much practical implication if you just accept it. But maybe in Sunny's study and other study, you really, you really want to get to, you know, am I a dispensationalist? Am I a covenantal? Am I a new covenantal? This is Voss. You heard it first from Voss. The substance upon which the impression was made un under the Old Testament may have been earthly clay. It's physical. It's a type. Nonetheless, the matrix that stamped it bore the uh, lineaments of eternal law and truth. So intertwine in the physical salvation of Israel, this matrix, the, these components of eternal law and truth. The same gets to the question with the Mosaic law and the, new, and the law of Christ. The, the Mosaic law it has these eternal law and truth components such that you can't separate the two, such that you can preach the, the Old Testament law considering Christ because they both contain the same truths. We can here observe again how inseparable, inseparably revelation through words is united to facts. <laughs> May for whole stretches the demarcation line between acts and words may have seemed to have been lost together. So this is why I emphasize the seed flower motif picture. The seed looks so different outwardly to the flower, yet internally it's the same. It has the same genetics. I, I emphasize this. So now we're seeing this play out. Outwardly, there's parts of the Mosaic, uh, the Mosaic Law. Outwardly, there's parts of this redemption that seem to be different. So that you would say, the flower cannot be the seed. It's different. They're too different. Yet when you get into the, into the details, you would say, no, it's the same. And so we're going to be looking through scripture where at one point you would say, oh, that salvation is different from the New Testament. And then in others, it's like, it's the same. And it's more than just physical. It's more than just physical. It's, it's eternal. The, the two are intertwined so that you cannot, you cannot separate the two out. So you, you, you've heard it first from Voss. Okay, so if ever you, someone else comes up with a conclusion, Voss said it first. So, and he was a covenant theologian, by, I might add. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit excited. I'm, 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 I'm a little bit excited, I'm sorry. Um, okay. So what are the factual basis and relationship of the redemption from Egypt to, and the New Testament? What are these factual? Number one, deliverance from foreign bondage. <laughs> The deliverance from foreign bondage. Uh, is it just a physical deliverance from physical slavery? It's merely a social issue. <laughs> no eternal ramifications. Redemption is here portrayed as, before everything else, a deliverance from an objective realm of sin and evil. <laughs> is is is. Is Egypt, is Pharaoh just simply a, a, a physical taskmaster that's just, 
it's purely social. <laughs> it's only a physical type. There's no spiritual eternal truth. Uh, what held under the Hebrews was not mere political dependence. If you were to say the only issue was political dependence, <laughs> that would be so offensive, right? That would be so offensive. It's not mere political dependence, but harsh bondage. Their condition is represented as a condition of slavery. The Egyptians exploited them for their selfish ends, regardless of Israel's own welfare. Ever since redemption has attached itself to the imagery of enslavement to an alien power. So from your reading in Voss, what, what other power besides Pharaoh was Israel enslaved to? Was it just Pharaoh? Or was there something behind Pharaoh? Can anyone give me an answer? Or from your reading in, in Exodus, we're thinking spiritual, we're thinking, uh, we're thinking of the kingdom of Satan. <laughs> Is there anything in the Exodus that would make us think, man, it's more than just a type. It's, it is a type, but it's more than a type. Is there anything, anything stated? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll do, we'll do Bullboy was first, uh, Attorney Bullboy, and then Ray follow up. Go ahead, um, Corey Bullboy. I think uh, it was mentioned earlier by Kaya that the connection of the bondage from slavery is connected to our bondage of sin. That's why people had to realize, the Israelites had to realize they need a redeemer to, to deliver them from the bondage of slavery to our, yeah. to our end and to our part. We need to yeah. realize we need a redeemer to, to free us, to redeem us from the bondage of sin. That is where the connection lies and that is the, the application yeah. to us as far as yeah. the the redemption, the rebellions from the of the Egyptians from from this uh, bondage of slavery. No, actually, otherwise so, you are correct. That's just a mere uh, political exercise. But yeah. there is, there is, there is. <laughs> no, so no, excellent. So I'm coming to you, Ray, next. But so Ray, so so Attorney Bullboy brings out that there is direct co connection between the bondage with our bondage and of sin, and so. Uh, passages we do not have time to go to tonight. Maybe we'll go to on Wednesday night or we can discuss later. But John 8, 33 to 36 and Romans 8, 20 and 21 describe that Jesus was referring to the Israelites as being under bondage and the, and the Hebrews and, the, and, and uh, uh, the, the religious establishment was denying it, especially in John 8. And it's like, no, you, you were a slave. And they're like, we were never a slave to anyone. And it's like, you were, okay? So there is this direct connection with bondage to sin. Now, again, you're, we're getting there, but let me follow up the question. Uh, Ray, you say what you're going to say, then, then, then I'll go on. Uh, what were you going to say, Ray? Yeah, I think as boss mentioned, he said here, Sin is at every point more than the sum total of purely human influences it brings to bear upon us with big things. Because in his context here, it says, a religious demonic background is thrown back of human figures that move across the canvas. So there is, there is the bandage in terms of uh, demonic influence, particularly in the Egyptian idolatry. Bam! You you they think you get the gold star. So there is I, Egyptian idolatry behind the scenes, and later we're going to see that God says that He is going to destroy even the the the, the gods of the Egyptians. So so the, the, the fight between the Lord and Pharaoh was not just was it was not just God versus a king. It was God against the forces. Uh, of of the idols and the gods of of Egypt, and we're fools if we don't say that's 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 satanic behind that. What's the principle? What's the principle from from uh, <laughs> from Genesis? I'll get you the second chalmer. What's the principle from Genesis three? Yeah, the, the the symbol of death, but also the king, right? The offspring. The the, the offspring is the is the offspring of Satan. Diva, right? we talked about that. Is it his kingdom or is it the offspring of man? We said it's both, Diva. Does that align with the kingdom of Satan? <laughs> yeah, the seed of Satan. So we're seeing the seed of Satan here being played out both in Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the seed of Satan. 
and behind Pharaoh is the kingdom of Satan. So it's war. It is more than just a physical picture of, of physical, bond, uh, socio-economic, political <laughs> bondage. Um, who, uh, Chalmer, go ahead, ask your question. Uh, yeah, it's not a question, Pastor. Actually, I, I would uh, add uh, in my OT, uh, Old Testament uh, class, uh, I remember when we studied uh, Exodus, all those <laughs> plagues is a uh, counter, uh, all those ten, ten plagues actually are counter to every gods of the Egyptians, like the god of sun, the darkness, so forth. Absolutely. So, so you're absolutely correct. Excellent observation, Chalmer. And so what we're seeing here is that for sure, I want to emphasize this, the, the salvation, the redemption of, of Israel from, uh, from Egypt, it's a type pointing to us. At the same time, it's more than just a, this physical picture. It, it, is, it is, they are being saved from the bondage of these gods. They're being saved from the, from, from the bondage of, 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 of sin that's being created by them submitting to these gods. I hope everyone sees that. Anyone else want to add? Concrete, the word for tonight, concrete. <laughs> if you see the concrete connection, whether you want to admit it or not, you're probably covenant. You're, you're probably, co a, 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 you're, you're functionally reading this from a covenantal perspective, if you see the concrete connection. Um, mo moving on here. So more stuff on the deliverance from foreign bondage. Uh, Pharaoh's hardened heart <laughs> is a type of the human nature, right? We saw, we saw in Genesis 4 to 6, Diba, that sin progressed and it led to, to judgment, right? Um, and so here we also see that Pharaoh's hardened heart is, it's, it's, it's a sin issue. It's a sin issue. It's not just political. It's political. <laughs> no, it's not. It's religious. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I'm excited. I just, I had a lot of coffee today. Forgive me. I think the other, other, other term, Pastor, is yeah. I know, spiritual degradation. Yeah, spiritual degradation. Yeah, excellent. That's another good, excellent. I, if I could, I'd add it here. Spiritual degradation. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, that's from Boss, Diba. Yeah, let's. Uh, God admitted. God admitted. He hardened Pharaoh's heart, so yeah. we don't have to answer that anymore. It's there. But but here's the thing, everyone. I hope you see this. This is why Voss's uh, observations originally maybe you're like, oh, it's it's a little bit allegorical. But this those principles that he brought up in 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 pre-redemption, in redemptive, in uh, in. Uh, especially during the patriarchal, like the, the, the principle of election, we're seeing, we're asking the same questions. We're asking the same questions. And what we should suppose is that the principle is there. And so it, it's just like clockwork. The, the principle that he identifies, we're going to be asking the same question. So we asked the question about Abraham's election. Now we're asking about Pharaoh's hardening of his heart. <laughs> Again, dealing with election. God did not choose him. God chose him to raise up, uh, God chose him uh, to, to raise him up as an enemy of him. So, <laughs> goodness, I hope you see this. It, you know, some people want to say boss is, is allegorical, but it's like, no, th these are principles in scripture uh, that are there and they come to light as we look both in the text and from the biblical theological framework. This is so fundamental. I hope that, I know you're probably stressed and, and the conversation was so deep earlier, but. Yeah, yeah we're getting it in. Good, good. Yeah, okay, let's thing, go, yeah. The thing is, let's make sure you don't get elected to be the enemy of God. <laughs> the what? You, you don't fall under the election of the enemy of God. <laughs> <laughs> No, I know, I know. But remember, that's not an excuse. What is the call for all of us? Repent and believe the gospel. The call for all of us today is repent and believe the gospel. It's there for you. It's there for me.
Good. Okay, let's go. Let's go here. Um, what time is it? Oh my goodness, it's eight fifty-three. All right. Um, <clears throat> oh, this is the quotation that Ray just gave. Was that Ray or is that who gave that? Was that Ray? A religious demonic background is thrown back of the human figures that move across the canvas. Not merely the Egyptians, but likewise the Egyptian gods are involved in the conflict. The plagues come here for notice. Chalmers quotation. They are inextricably mixed up with Egyptian idolatry. This idolatry, this idolatry was nature worship, embracing the good and benefic uh, beneficent, as well as the evil and baneful aspects of nature. Jehovah, in making these harm their own worshipers, shows his superiority to this whole realm of evil. For us, just to see this as physical is in one sense, we could say that. So at just a brief reading, a casual reading, we would say that. But when you get into the details, we could not say that. Uh, e the eternal struggle, it's the, the, the work of Satan behind the scenes. <clears throat> this is stated in so many words. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So this... This is not political economic. This is not merely socioeconomic. That is a terrible reading. And like today, you know, you have all these debates with capitalism, socialism, and they're rereading scripture through these political economic. It's like, that's a complete missing the whole fundamental point. The same demonic powers that were concerned in the anti-typical redemption wrought in Christ, and they are there displayed in their most intense activity. They had a hand in this opposition to the redemption from Egypt. So it's a concrete connection. And if you agree with the concrete connection, we can have different nuances in the covenant. We can have different nuances in debate. We can always have those, but we're looking at fundamental structures. If you fundamentally agree with these concrete relationships, then perhaps you're in one ca you're in one category. Uh, number two. So the first one, I'm using a, a, a B just to match the outline. Uh, so number one, there is real bondage of sin and slavery. So there's a physical and a spiritual bondage. They're 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 um, and remember, Diba. In, in Egypt, in these nations, the religion and the religion and the the political, the religious, and the the the, the all the different realms are in one. So so economic, familial, religious. In our society, we can separate the two. We can separate them out, right? Separation of church and state. These contexts, it's not the case. Uh, so they're all intertwined. Deliverance from sin. Deliverance from sin. There was a subjective side to it also. The Hebrews were delivered not merely from foreign bondage. Who said that? Who said the spiritual degradation? You guys are just getting my quotes. You're, you're there. You're with me. You're reading this. I'm just so happy. You, you saw it. Uh, they were likewise rescued from inward spiritual degradation and sin. I'll share this PowerPoint. Don't be stressed. Take notes, but I'll share the PowerPoint with you guys. These are the, these are the high points from, from, from Voss. True religion had not entirely vanished from among Israel. They still knew enough to perceive that Jehovah was the God of their fathers, for in the name of God of the patriarchs, Moses was sent to them. But it remains true that they must have existed enough of religious decline and corruption among them to make their deliverance from Egypt more than mere external benefit. So some people just, again, just a type. It's just a type. Physical salvation pointing to spiritual salvation. And Paul says, no, there is that spiritual component as well. It's deeper than just national deliverance. It should be remembered that in the history of God's people, ex external, so external bondage is frequently, uh, it's parallel with spiritual unfaithfulness. <laughs> so the physical, there was that, there was that, the, the internal behind the physical. So, so for example, Pharaoh physically raises his hand against Israel. Internally, he has a hard heart. Pharaoh's not going to have a believing heart and raise his hand against Israel, okay? Here, Israel's not going into exile. 
they're not going into bondage unless there is that that spiritual unfaithfulness connected when when we were discussing this uh part in our group during the breakout session i i i explained to the group that the factual basis is being used by boss to explain something that has to be explained later because like for us for us lawyers we we understand what are factual basis because we cannot rely on law we cannot rely on something unless there's a factual basis in the application of a particular law so here boss is trying to draw us our attention why is there a need for redemption what is the factual to us we call it what is the factual basis of the redemption that is that is god is presenting to israel and we need we need to realize that once we realize there is that factual basis and what there is a need really exists then we realize why we need redemption as far as there is is concerned what i was explaining to our group was that they need to realize that there is there is such thing as slavery and to us there is such a thing also as slavery or the bondage from sin we need to raise up as a fact as a fact it exists it is not a mere uh, mindful matter that's only in the mind it's a reality it's a, that's what you call it's a fact that is what i i believe is boss is trying to explain to us why there is a factual basis uh, and and kuya boy that goes right back to to kuya henry what he was saying that applying it to us so we we come from full circle with henry's uh, prophetic prophetic statement <laughs> excellent uh, ray go ahead <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment on this particular phrase. And what said this? But the way I understand this thing is, uh, Israel stayed in Egypt for quite about how many? Two hundred years. Four hundred. Four hundred years. So definitely the the influence of um, religion of Egypt. Has really tipped into their social and what you call this uh, religious practices as well. So the chance of being contaminated is really very high. That's why God acted on this also to remove them from such influence eventually. No, that's really good. No, it's 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 we can't minimize the 400 years. I mean, that's a long time, and and to think that they would not have been influenced is just beyond belief so great observation and and excellent observation right yeah in connection with that sir team uh, i think uh, it's right to say that in addition to what uh, pastor ray said that uh, because of that influence i think they lost uh, the knowledge of jehovah na, uh, during that time yeah so that's why they know to ingoni and only attorney uh, it's really a factual fact yeah, yeah. They, they need redemption dude yeah no no so so There's multiple layers here. They they need they need it, it, I mean in their context for sure. Um but then also in in our context as well that that we are also seeing the factual reality of our own need. And this is coming to what Henry was saying that we have to recognize that this is also us. And I'll be to be very practical, it's easy for us to look at Israel and say, "Dude, they had They saw the parting of the Red Sea. How could they not believe in the wilderness? But we, for us to, to to make that statement is very prideful and arrogant, because we would be doing the same thing, and we do do the same thing. And so, um, yeah, uh, the factual is so is so imp- so important on many different levels. Yeah, great. That's why the word must become flesh. Yeah. Oh. Master Tim, I have a question. Okay, okay, go ahead. I yes, uh, because it's a uh, voice said here that, uh, the king first hardened himself, and then in punishment for this, he was further hardened by God. Yeah. So it was not. So does that mean that God did not just harden? It was Pharaoh was re. It's is it like Pharaoh is already because he is in bondage of his. He hard he his heart is already hard, so God further hardened it as punishment as well. 
there's debate there. Uh, there is such a thing as judicial hardening. So, so when we sin, uh, there's a certain point in which God gives us what we want. It's judicial hardening. He, he, let, he hardens our heart. And, and actually part of God's judgment is letting us carry out the sin to its fullest. Because at the end of the day, sin is death, right? So it, that's part of the punishment. Um, when you get to who at the end of the day, who at the end of the day, <clears throat> um, was it Pharaoh or was it God? And so uh, Romans 9 answers that. It's, he, you can go back and forth because times God hardens the heart, sometimes Pharaoh hardens the heart. Um, um, I have to go back and look at what, what Voss is saying to see that context there. But ultimately, it was God's, um, Pharaoh is not a believer. So, so but, but God does I not. Think, I, think, I, I think that is the, uh, the point of sin. I, I, I don't know if, uh, if I'm correct, but I think it's because uh, there's a bondage of sin. So when you yeah. sin, you cannot immediately, actually, you cannot escape from it. It's like, yeah. it's going to pull you deeper and deeper. So yeah. it's like, yeah. Uh, that's why uh, Pharaoh. It's not a, just a punishment, but it's it's what sin is. That's why he he hard. Although God acted on, it, I, I I'm not I'm not actually sure. I, I was actually thinking about this line. This is my question. Yeah. So what I would say is, <clears throat> looking at full revelation, Paul says at the end of the day, it was God that raised Pharaoh up to show his works among all nations his name would be glorified among the earth. So, so the ultimate source for, for Pharaoh's ultimate rebellion and destruction is coming from God. But, but th that's no way placing the blame upon God. Pharaoh always has the call to believe and to repent. But remember, it, the, the sin nature is such that he will not. And again, that's how all of us are. So it's, this is why this comes back to divine monergism. It comes back to God's supernatural work. It must be God's work that opens our eyes and that saves. So, 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 so in God not choosing to save Pharaoh, you would say that's unfair. That's unjust. But Pharaoh is just acting on his nature. That's who he is. God does not owe Pharaoh to save him. God doesn't owe anyone anything. That's going to get into the name of God. <laughs> it's going into the name of the Lord. It's 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 not yes, easy. Yes, I understand. Yes, I understand now, Pastor Kim. So what you mean is that um, Pharaoh is naturally he because he's a sinner and God chose yeah. not to redeem him. Yeah. And then it is actually this. Actually, I was re I read it. It is the well-known scriptural law of sin being punished by irretrievable abandonment to sin. So it's like. Yeah sin pulling you to another and yeah. then going deeper and deeper yeah. so it's only god who can redeem us really yeah yeah so 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 imagine this pharaoh pharaoh the, the command for god in nature and everywhere is to repent and to trust in the redeemer that that's anyone can do it uh, anyone anyone uh it, that 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 promise is open to anyone but the question is, what is in the what is in man's heart? And the sin nature is such that he will not. And so it takes an act of God to reveal and to change the heart. That's 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 the reality. That's what we were seeing from, from Genesis until now. That it that this is the condition of man, and it takes God's supernatural act to redeem and to save. Uh Sonny, what were you gonna say? Uh so I just wanted to say. So this is back to the divine predestination yeah. uh, of, of God. Because uh, at that, if you read Exodus plainly, it's really God's yes. to harden his heart. Yes, yes. Uh, for the purpose, so for one, one, with one purpose to draw out his people, his choosing people. Uh, in fact, it, it comes back to election, but again. Yeah. Um, just like what I have said now, uh, uh, can God purposely raise up sinners like Pharaoh for the purpose of his glory? Yes, yeah, so when you're saying he's raising up sinners, he's not forcing them to sin. He's not making them sin. 
He's simply allowing them to be who they are, and then he's using them to bring about his purpose. Habakkuk 1.6 is very clear. God raised up Babylon. But, but we wouldn't say that he's the one causing them to sin. He's simply allowing them, yeah. and, and then they become his tool for whatever purpose he has. But he's, he's using all things, to, Ephesians 1, God uses all things to bring about uh, the purpose of his will. Uh, yeah. he's, he's created even the wicked for the day of judgment. So that's it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, in one sense, it's a hard saying. In another sense, that's the depravity of our sin nature. It comes back to our sin nature. What about, what about the story of Nebuchadnezzar? Can we put it here as, who is, who is worse, the Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar? Pharaoh. <laughs> I think, yeah, and Nebuchadnezzar repented, right? At the, the end yeah he repented at the end he repented yeah uh pharaoh becomes the type he becomes the example in the history of the world of what happens when someone raises up their hand against god's chosen people he is the 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 example in redemptive history of what happens of god's power on display it's the exodus event is crazy it's the most amazing for me, my, my new favorite passage of scripture is the Psalm of, of the Song of Moses in Exodus 15. It's, you know, it just brings the power of God and he's, he's for us. He's for us. <laughs> um, man, it's strong. Okay, it is late. It is late here. Um, so let's, let's continue this on Wednesday night. Um, I know that there's a few of you that can't attend. Maybe you can reach out to me privately. We can make a plan or you can watch the YouTube, but we're gonna just going to continue this. We're going to continue this right on in. There's so much information. I didn't want to rush this. I really hope that we can see, we set the table so we see the issues and we're just going to work through chapter eight, not chapter seven. That was my fault, I think, uh, chapter eight. But I really want us to come away with a place of, uh, is this a concrete connection? If so, this has practical implications in our lives, in our ministries. And some of you, you know, maybe it's like, okay, that makes sense. I don't want to go into these. Fair enough. But I, what I want us to see is that, is that we, we are concrete connected with Israel. We are by faith children of Abraham. <laughs> He's our father. We are children of the promise because we are in union with Christ the Messiah, the promised seed of the woman. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. I will see you Wednesday night by God's grace if we have power. Okay, so let's go on to, to the third point concerning factual, the factual basis and relationship of the redemption from Egypt and the, and the New Testament. And so... That's a gamma, so that's the third point here, is this display of divine omnipotence. So Voss brings out that there is a display of divine omnipotence. And omnipotence is the display uh, is power. So div God's pure power. Where have we seen God's power so far in, in the history of, of redemption and revelation? Give me some other examples of God's divine power. Bird of Isaac. Yeah, the birth of, of Isaac is a huge display of divine omnipotence, divine monergism. No one helps God. He supernaturally brings Isaac to life through a dead womb and through very old um, uh, men, uh, Abraham and his wife, Sarah. So that's one example. What's another example of divine omnipotence that we see preceding? Yes, uh, the flood during the West time. Yeah. So we saw the flood was an incredible display of God's power. The Ba El Shaddai is, is overcoming. There's this idea of overcoming, and so he overcomes nature. And so in the flood event, God overcomes uh, and destroys all of creation. And so, you know... Uh, here now we have yet another example of divine power, divine all-powerfulness. 
Notice this, Voss says, when Moses in his own strength sought to deliver the people, this resulted in failure. When did this happen? When did Moses seek in his own strength to deliver the people? So I think, I think what Kay was saying was, when he tried, when he when he killed the Egyptian, right? Was that what you were saying? I, I kind of caught part of yes, that. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So when, so when when Moses, when Moses killed the Egyptian to try to to to, to help his fellow man, and complete wash, he had to flee. Correct. So it's so interesting how Abraham tries to help himself, Jacob tries to help himself, <laughs> right? God will not be a partner. God will not be a partner with man bringing about his power. So what, we, what we're beginning to see here is that God promises and then he does. He promises or he declares what he will do and then he does it. So we talked about, the, we talked about before the, the word and then the act. The God gives the word and so remember what Voss says, the, the, the revelation is inseparable from redemption. Revelation is given and then the act follows. Redemption occurs following it. So Exodus 3.20, uh, the Lord declares, I, he will smite Egyptians with all wonders. Exodus 4.21, this is before the event, right? He will put wonders in the hands of Moses. Exodus 6.6, 6, he redeems Israel with an outstretched arm and great judgments. So what we see here is there's this promise of what he will do, and then he does. Okay, and maybe that's, maybe that's review for you. But that is, that's really important because remember, it's a pattern for us in the New Testament, right? So it's the, the, if, if God does it this way in Exodus, in the uh, redemption from Egypt, Sigurado, he will do it again for us. Not only does he promise to bring judgments, God also works in Pharaoh and through Pharaoh. So this comes back, if you're talking about Calvinism, you're talking about the work, the work of God, irresistible grace. People will say that God can do whatever he wants, but the, the human will is unaffected. Otherwise, we're just robots. Okay. But but here, uh, whatever else happens, is God impacting Pharaoh's heart? The heart is the faculty of decision making. L look at this, everyone, you have to see this. Exodus 7 3, I will harden Pharaoh's, it should say heart, not water, it should be heart. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land. Of Egypt. So even if at times Pharaoh hardens his heart, even if at even if originally Pharaoh was unrepentant, the reality is is that God is working in Pharaoh's heart against Pharaoh's will to actually bring about Pharaoh's destruction. Can you receive that? That's hard. That's powerful. Whatever else, that's very difficult. So people will talk about. When it comes to salvation, that how can God, you know, have irresistible grace? How can how can He, you know, work in someone's will? You know, we we, we don't have free will anymore. We, we could discuss that, but the reality is here. This is in the text. This is not negotiable. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. You can't get around that. It's a fact. A fact of history and reality. Exodus 9, 16, in very deed for this cause, I have made you to stand. So who's raising up Pharaoh? It's not Pharaoh. In very deed for this cause, I have made you to stand. For to show you my power and that my name will be declared through all the earth. Again, very strong statement. It doesn't seem to be fair. But at the end of the day, God is the king of the universe, and nothing is outside of his control. Nothing is outside of his control. This is part of the harder aspects of scripture that we have to accept. This should bring great 
comfort and encouragement to us. Why, why would this statement, although it might seem really hard, why would this statement bring us comfort and encouragement? Let's talk about this for a minute. Why do you suppose that this would bring us encouragement and comfort? Yeah, God is sovereign. Yeah, God is sovereign. So, so get, get practical. Get practical, Danny. Get applicational in our context right now. 21st century COVID. Why? How, how, how does this apply to our situation? God has uh, brought us this uh, COVID pandemic for a wake-up call. Yeah, it's a wake-up call. Yeah, it could be a wake-up call for sure. Henry, go ahead. Without, without everything, everything what is happening now, it, uh, it is controlled. Everything is un, uh, controlled by God. No, yeah. everything is under him. He yeah. and virus cannot cannot harm us without uh, yeah. if God says I will do not harm my children. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah. No, that's really good. It, so I think what 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 Henry's saying is it's in God's control. So if God can affect the heart of Pharaoh, he can control a virus. He can protect us from a virus. If he can control the greatest king at this time in the known world, if he, if he can control his heart, he can control a virus. So him allowing the virus to continue, it's under his control. He is in control of it. That doesn't mean we don't act wisely. It doesn't mean that we don't protect ourselves. It doesn't mean that we exercise caution, wisdom. It is to say that whatever happens, when it happens, we do what's in accordance with what his revealed will is for us and his command. But we accept the fact that he is in control and he's working for a greater purpose, right? So God raised up Pharaoh, right? In the midst, right? They're, they were, the, the, the Israelites are, fair, are, are experiencing terrible, they're experiencing terrible suffering, Biba. The, 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 the bondage was hard. And in the moment, they could say like, Lord, what are you doing? But here we see that he was raising up Pharaoh. He cares about his children, but he wants his name to be declared through all the earth. The name being declared through all the earth. What's another word? What's another term we, we say today? If, if God's name is being declared in all the earth, what, what's another terminology? Christianese. The name of God being declared in all the earth. What's the word? That we are doing now in our Jesus, church. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Christ. And what's that key word of what we're doing? What's the key Pro word? Proclaim in his name. Okay, proclaiming his name. So what's what's that terminology? It's it's you know, it's on the tip of your tongue. What is it? The gospel, in right? It's the gospel. We're we're proclaiming the name of Christ, we're also proclaiming the gospel, right? It's the same, it's the same. But what I want us to see here is, everyone, think about this for a second. Here, God's judgment is the means by which his name is proclaimed. Do you see that? So, so, God, so God's power is revealed in his judgment. God's power is revealed in his creation. God's God's power is uh, God's power is revealed in his salvation acts. So what I want us to see is that both positively and negatively uh, God's God's name is declared, it's proclaimed he receives glory. So when people we we typically only think one dimensional, brothers and sisters, we think one dimensional in that God only receives glory in the proclaiming of the gospel and the saving of souls. Can you accept that God also receives glory in the judgment of the rebel? Think about that for a second. God receives glory in the judgment of the rebel. Yeah, yes. He did it to Pharaoh. Yeah. And he did it to Judas. Practical. Again, we're getting practical here. Practically speaking here, 
when people say, why would, so one of the, the fundamental questions, we always come back to this, why would God allow Satan to exist? Why would God not just keep the garden the way it was? Do you, does everyone see here that God revealed, displayed his glory in creation, but there's other ways that he can display his glory that he could not had creation only stayed in the garden. Is everyone tracking there with me? So this would be a, a possible, legitimate, real answer as to why God's plan was for man to fall and for, uh, for sin to increase so that his glory, his name would be proclaimed both in our salvation and in the judgment of the rebel. So many places we could go here. The last thing I want to say is this. The last thing I want to say is this, is that, you know, in the U.S., we're, we're struggling. You know, there's, we're very free, right? Americans are free, and there's a struggle, and there's always the fear in, of, of, political, of politics and who's in charge. And maybe even here in the Philippines or in Asia, you know, there's, there's various dictators that rise up. There's different rulers, and I'm not thinking specifically of the Philippines. I'm thinking of Asia. You have Asia. You have Africa. There's bad regimes is what I'm trying to say. They, 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 are, they are raised up. And what I want us to see here is that when those nations are raised up, we need to recognize that it is God behind the scenes. God has ordained that to happen, just like here. When we see, when we see a, a, whether a good or a, or a bad regime raised up, um, uh, behind the scenes, God is, is working, and it's for his greater purpose. That does not mean that God is promoting sin. It does not mean that God is promoting bad behavior. It is to say that he's working all things to be, bring about his perfect plan for us, and, and his people. And so here, whereas Israel was terrified, they were terrified. They're in, enslaved. How could this be happening? But behind the scenes, God was doing something great. And so when we can't see it, when we can't see the, the when we can't see the in, in the distance and we just are in the difficult situation, we need to trust and we need to look to Pharaoh and say, no, God was working there and he had this great plan. And so in our situation, in our terrible situations, maybe it's, maybe it's in your local context. You know, there's maybe a, a, a difficult situation. At the end of the day, God has ordained it. And we need to trust in his greater uh, providence and sovereignty that he's bringing it uh, about for his purpose. The climax and summary of this power is found in Exodus 15. So we don't typically think of this. But there are great passages of scripture that describe who God is. Exodus 15 is one of them. Exodus 15 is one of the greatest passages in the Old Testament. It describes the power of God in the redemption of his people. It describes the shepherding. If you were in class on, on Tuesday night, God shepherding his people and bringing them to his holy mountain. And it concludes with the sovereignty and reign of God. It concludes with the sovereignty and reign of God at the end of the chapter. Exodus 15. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. So in judging, in judging Egypt, God is receiving, the Lord is receiving glory and praise. He is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. Look, look at the praise, the, the, the exaltation of the name of, of, of the Lord for saving, Egypt, uh, for saving Israel and destroying Egypt. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. 
So this is uh, this is the acts. This is the acts of the Lord. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, at the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The flood stood up in a heap. The, the deeps congealed. In the heart of the sea, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead into the mighty waters. Who is like you among the gods? Who is like you majestic in holiness? Awesome and glorious deeds doing wonders. So again, this is the, the axe. You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led your steadfast people whom you have redeemed. We talked about this. This is the work of a shepherd. So God as war, God as warrior, God as shepherd, right? Now, uh, in looking at the shepherd motif, perhaps also they have this idea of shepherding above, but it's described as a man of war. So most likely it's the Lord as a warrior. That, that destroys his enemies, the Lord as a shepherd to his people. So the references here, you have led them, you have guided them in your steadfast love. This is covenantal love. The peoples have heard, they troubled. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom are dismayed. Trembling seizes the, la the leaders of Moab. All of the Cain, all of the the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread falls upon them. Because of your, the greatness of your arm, they are still as stone. Till your people pass by, O Lord, till your people pass by whom you have purchased. So this word here is redeemed. Now, we talked about this, Diba. We talked about this. Is this just a type? Is there concrete salvation? Is this salvation more? It's physical for sure, but is it also more than that? Okay, that's not to say that in saving the people that everyone was eternally saved. Okay, it is to say that those that that received the salvation of the Lord, they were trusting in Him in genuine faith. Uh, this salvation is also eternal salvation. Is everyone tracking there with, with me on that? They were trusting in the promises of God at the time, and they were believing that he would save them. So, so, so there is a sense in which, of course, this is physical salvation. They were saved physically from Egypt. But the question that Voss asked that we must ask is, is, is it more than that? Meaning to say that those people that trusted in, the, in Yahweh, if they had genuine faith, were they also saved eternally. Is, is everyone tracking there with me? You will bring them and plant them on your mountain, the place which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever. <laughs> so it goes from this physical event. So let me be clear here. This is, this here is uh, the question is, the question that we're asking is this, is this physical, spiritual, or both? That's the question. Many people say it's just physical. It's just, it's just the here and the now. They're just saved from Egypt. Others, um, uh, you know, so, so, so is it just spiritual? Is it both? You know, well, others will say, no, it doesn't matter whether it's physical. It's the, it's, it's, it's the truth that's being taught. It's the parable of the story that matters, not whether or not it's physical. Here, here clearly, the here clearly, this is this is this is physical, this is physical death. This is this is physical, right? Physical event. But then here, this seems to be <laughs> who is like you, O Lord, among the gods. It's like beyond the physical. It's not just a physical salvation. Diva, who is like you among the gods? This is already uh spiritual everyone sees that 
there's already this work beyond the physical realm that that that, that, that this is is going into the spiritual the eternal the the the, the eternal re- realm okay you have this reference to covenantal steadfast love which is much more than physical this is also spiritual and physical if if ever you were unsure by the time you get down to here this is already the eternal kingdom of god what will often happen especially in the prophets so this is a song this is a theological song you have this like this in prayers pastor henry with hannah's prayer it's like she's praising over the 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 the, the gift of the son and then by the end, it's like the end of time. It's like the end of time, the final judgment, and like the Messiah is being established forever. Do you see what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to get at here, brothers and sisters, is that is that what Voss was saying before is that the, the physical and the eternal is 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 merged into one. So that in one sense it's just physical, in another sense, it's 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 like eternal. So so the, the, the two are, are intertwined. You cannot separate the two. And that's why he refers to this as being connected with our salvation in the New Testament. So that when these people believed, they trusted in the Lord. If they had genuine faith, okay, they were partakers of the new covenant. They were partakers of Christ. They were partakers of the eternal kingdom that is to come. And you see it right here in the text. The Lord will reign forever. It's already beyond. It's beyond anything. <laughs> that's not even referring to, that's not even referring to, 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 to David's kingdom. This is beyond. This is transcends everything. So is everyone tracking there with me? So going back to the conversation on Monday, we talked about concrete connection. That there is a concrete connection, if you can imagine here. Old Testament, New Testament. There's a there's a concrete connection between the two. Okay, so if we only see the Old Testament as a shadow and type, if we only see the Old Testament as moving us on to something to something else, not recognizing that it's part of the foundation. You're cutting yourself away from all the promises in actuality. You're cutting out all those promises. So is is everyone tracking, when we think about big picture here, is everyone tracking with me the, the, the significance? Let's just take a pause, ask a question, make a comment, maybe give me some pushback. Don't be afraid to give me some pushback. Um, let's just uh, take a moment here. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. This disprove this disprove the concept or the view of dispensational and dispensationalism. This, this disprove. W- yeah. This would be so. This would be um, now. They would say it doesn't. I would say it's part of the package. I would say this is part. This is part of the package because what it's disproving is the fact that dispensationalism says that. The church, the New Testament, is a different plan of God uh, from Israel. Okay, it's different. This would be, if, if you were to say this disproves, I would say this would be this would be part of the disproving of it, of of dispensationalism, uh, especially if you're looking at the original classic dispensationalism. Dispensationalism dispensationalists have kind of come back and they've kind of modified their system. If you were to argue this, just this text alone with what I just shared, they, they would they would push back and say, no, it doesn't, no, it doesn't, because we, we hold to, to, to God's kingdom in the so I don't I don't want us to overstate the case, Henry, but you are correct that this would be this would be part of the case to really saying that it that it's one it's one plan of God. Yeah. I just don't want to overstate our case because we do have to look at a lot more than just this. But this would be you are correct in saying this is part of it, yes. I, I do want to make one other caveat. In one sense, there's a lot of really good people that are new covenant. There's a lot of good people that are dispensational. So even though I dis, I would disagree with dispensationalists, there's a lot of good people. And I would say at the end of the day, um, 
many of us are inconsistent with our framework. And so functionally, probably most of what dispensationalists would say, they would agree. So like they would agree with this, you know, uh, so um, I'm looking specifically at, at the system, but you know, even if you were to ask a dispensationalist, they would probably say everything I said, amen, amen, amen. But for our purposes at this point, what I want us to see is the concrete connection between the two. Okay, let's, let's go back to the, let's go back to the text. Um, uh, let's go back. Uh, I will say one last thing. So, so, so many of these things like in the Old Testament, you'll, you'll see this. It seems to be like, it's just literal, but then it seems to transcend. So with a lot of the promises to Israel, it seems to be literal, but then it transcends like the physical of the here and now. It's like, it's, it's, it's similar to this. And so that, that would, uh, would as well be uh, a, a problem with, 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 with that as well. So be thinking about when you read the prophets and you see something that looks to be literal and then all of a sudden it's like the end of time, cataclysmic battle, you know, it's like, but, you know, it goes from like a physical judgment of, of like Babylon to like the final judgment. That's how it's structured. It's structured in such a way that because, the, but because the two are inseparable, we're, 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 we're moving through redemption, revelation history, and it's just one plan. That's looking near, looking far, looking near, looking far. And it's, it's just one, one plan of God. Uh, Vol says, this is a unique accumulation of miracles in this part of history. God works not just in powerful outward physical acts, but in the heart to bring about his judgment and deliverance. God works all things to bring about his purposes in this event, including the hardening of heart, which is a major theme. So this is really a major point, if you want to write this down, that God is using everything to bring about his, his, his plan. And this is how he's going to act in history. So this is why the Exodus event is the type, the picture of our eternal salvation. And at the same time, those people that were involved in that salvation were participants in the salvation that is to come because they were trusting in the Lord in faith and they were trusting in, 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 the, in, uh, um, what was revealed to them at that time. So, so sometimes theologians will distinguish between uh, order of salvation and history of salvation. So right now we're talking about the history of salvation. History of salvation is objective once, once, one events per, you can't replicate this. Order of salvation is what happens in us to be saved. And that happens over and over again in all our different lives over time as we as we convert and choose to follow Jesus, okay? So, so we, we also need to make this distinction between the order of salvation, which is subjective, and the history of salvation, which is objective. And we talked about that back in, in the introductory issues. Uh, go, go back and watch that video um, to, to, to see that. The 10 plagues... The 10 plagues, a number of completion in scripture and the dividing of the waters is the culminating act in, the, in this drama in which God's people are saved while the enemy is utterly destroyed. So when we look at fundamental stories in, in, in scripture, we typically tend to think of them all as on equal level, equal playing field, right? So whether it's, whether, whether it's uh, you know, David and Goliath or Gideon, uh, that's not the case. Some are much more fundamental than others. And the Exodus is one of those fundamental passages of scripture. So, and the big, the big story of the Bible, Exodus, the salvation from Egypt is, is a fundamental story in the Bible's big story. So it's, it's the redemption of the Old Testament. And that's promising, that's prophesying of this coming greater salvation that is to come. Areas where God exercises his divine omnipotence. So in this example, we're going to list for us the areas where God exercises divine omnipotence. And again, this comes back, practically speaking to us, that we need to rest and trust in the sovereign God in spite of our situations over nature. Water, sun, moon, stars, skies, animals, sea. <laughs> everything. God uses everything to just slap Egypt. 
He uses everything. He's El Shaddai. He's El Shaddai. He overcomes and uses everything. Over man, <laughs> right? So he's controlling Pharaoh to bring about his purpose. He can't be stopped. Over spiritual beings and powers. So, so the plagues, the 10 plagues, he's exercising his power over what those physical images, those physical creations are, are, are being represented. And so liberals today will say, no, no, there's no spiritual war. No, it was, pro it was spiritual warfare, and there was a demonic kingdom behind Egypt. You see that, right? Even the, the, the magicians, they're doing the magic. <laughs> Right. That was probably demonic. That's not that's taboo to say today. I could not say that in a in a seminary in the US without being laughed at. But that was demonic. This reveals that God is the Lord, the creator God alone, and it is more than just a physical salvation. So it is a physical salvation. It is physically escaping Egypt. But it's also more than that. Okay. In, in yeah. their exit from Egypt, it is a redemption plan. It's a redemption. Yes. Plan. Yeah. When they cross the Red Sea, it is baptism to them. Yeah. Yeah. That's what that's exactly what Paul says. That's exactly what Paul says. And so for us not to see that, you know, maybe this goes against a literal hermeneutic but that's what paul says so we have to accept that we have to accept that that it's more than just a wooden literalistic interpretation we have to accept that that that's that's part of from hermeneutics before that was part of why we need to include typology very carefully but we have to include more than just a literal uh reading just when i say literal reading i just a narrow reading in the context without considering the biblical framework when you consider the biblical framework it makes perfect sense it's not abusing the text it makes perfect sense especially when you see what we just shared so excellent observation henry really good um this we're, we'll, we'll be we'll finish on that tonight let me just wet your whistle so